I think like if you can't soften the body up, it is going to be very difficult to get into deep stage realization. Like you have a chance to actually see the reaction formation in a much clearer way. I was so reactive after 14 years of pretty hardcore Vipassana, you know, and yet I was getting into jhana states, incredible states of tranquility. It's pretty difficult to have a silent mind if you've got tension in the occipital ridge, just something practical to know. If there's like restless energy, if there's contraction in the body and we have some practical and efficient ways to get at that, like why the hell not? Getting that tension out can be really quite profound for people. The following is a conversation with Chris Scamand. Chris is an amazing human being with a wealth of practice experience spanning things like 14 years of diehard vipassana meditation to open awareness based practices and you may have seen her excellent interview if i if you haven't already on angelo de lulo's channel where she talks at length about uh, what sort of led to some significant shifts and awakening experiences if you could call them that in her life. In this conversation, we touch on some very important subjects that I think are rarely talked about in these spheres as it relates to energetic regulation. Chris demonstrates where the body holds trauma and what the implications are if we allow ourselves to actually address and release that, whether it's through TRE or any other energetic practice. We discuss what actually is equanimity. You know, is it the notion of feeling better or is it this release of reactivity at the fundamental root? Chris also offers a very grounded critique on Vipassana meditation for those diehard meditators out there who are set on not altering their experience in any way. We talk about doing belief work and energetic work to help ease this process of psycho-spiritual unfoldment. I asked Chris, you know, whether it's even important if we honor the story or not, can we just go without and uh, restrict our energetic regulation practices to just bodily movement? And later on in the conversation, we talk more about TRE and energetic regulation practices that can greatly benefit us in this psycho-spiritual unfoldment. So, this conversation is really for you if you are really looking to just experience more ease in your daily life. And if you're just fed up with psycho-spiritual unfoldment being so uncomfortable and painful. And if that is you, this conversation is well worth listening to. Now, you can find Chris Gaman's links in the description. I would highly recommend her. She is an awakening facilitator with obviously a wealth of practice knowledge and has been endorsed by Angelo DeLulo himself, the man, the myth, the legend. So, you're not going wrong. I also refer people to Chris sometimes if they're particularly struggling with significant energetic dysregulation. So, yeah, uh, without further ado, let's get into the conversation. I think energetic regulation was something that came to mind for me, especially with the awakening unfoldment that isn't really talked about that much, right? Yeah. Like a lot of intense energetics has really been a hallmark of my experience with uh, psycho-spiritual unfoldment, you know, mm. and doing a lot of apasana initially, being very serious about it early on sort of being um, feeling a lot of anxiety in my experience and then thinking that, you know, Vipassana is going to be the Holy Grail that will, that will sort of save me and like, oh God, and all the energetics and repressed emotions that came with that and just having to find my own sea legs, <laughs> trying to like integrate that. So I work with people in somatic inquiry, uh, which I've got a couple of clients today, but um, yeah, I'm super, super keen to pick your brain on, like, I don't yeah. know if you relate, relate to any of that and what it's been like oh. for you in, yeah. in the, in the yeah. unfoldment. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, In the, in the, in the Gwenka tradition, you know, you're really, you know, you're very much on your own and you're up against that system, you know, and, and beliefs mm. about how this unfolds. And I've said to people, like, if the next Buddha showed up in those 10 day retreats, mm. you know, they would be. <laughs> you know, dismissed, you know, as delusional, you know, if they... I'm actually banned from going to them. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, the unfortunately, you know, and, and I think that you have the same appreciation as well, that in some respects, there's a, there's a reverence for that stuff, for that tradition. But yeah. um, 
Yeah, like for like you know, I'm banned from going because they saw I posted a video on how to do um, um, a different type of anapana meditation by focusing on belly on your belly breathing, and I'm like, you know, yeah. Anyway, I could, but but I, I'm grateful for the retreats, but it's like, yeah, come on. Yeah, it's very it's very isolated, you know. Like mm. they they don't those people they don't attend you know other conferences on awakening. There, it's. Even the way that you have, you know, when you when you reply to go back to another course, like their their questions are kind of suggesting that if you've done anything else, well, you know, that's questionable. Yeah. And you know, uh, it, it there's subtle and not so subtle ways of just saying uh, this is like the one true religion. I, you know, I said in the interview with Angela, I find it the the Goenka. Uh, the Pasana retreats are to me very much like the Catholic Church of the Buddhist world. It's like mm. one true church, and everybody else yeah. is, you know, on the wrong path. And uh, very yes, funny. yes, I had that vibe as well. And and I think just putting my feet into it because I think like you, it was um, I heard in the interview again. I just I was listening to it before. Um, you said that it was like one of the more convenient options for you, just like by means of location to start investigating deeper truths of experience and going yeah. into your mind, going on, going on a Vipassana retreat. And it's the same for me. Like, yeah. Um, and, but that impression I got was that, you know, I, I feel like culty is a bit of a heavy word maybe, but um, enmeshment, maybe there was some enmeshment going on. Like, um, just, just from my initial observations, and maybe that might be refreshed from if I were to, you know, like go back now, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Something yeah. just felt off energetically, and I didn't know how to name it at that point. I don't think I was still learning to trust myself. Yeah. yeah. I'll share with you a story. Uh, mm. This was a, it was a Vipassana retreat, you know, that was scheduled to take place in some, I don't know, like semi rural place in India. And you know, as you know, to go to a ten-day retreat, it's a it's a lot of preparation for people to you know carve out that time, make arrangements with it for their family, for work, and so on, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the teacher arrived, and as it you know happens, you know, in in India, not unfrequently in certain places, they lost power, so there was no electricity to play the recordings or you know the the video lectures, and what happened was uh, three days went by and the teacher was just sitting there, you know, just hoping that the electricity would come back. And by, by the third day, he realized, okay, I'm just going to start. I'm just going to teach this myself. And so he just started the instructions, right? Okay. Yeah, He's an appointed yeah. teacher. And anyway, he got into so much trouble over this. Like he was basically told, mm. no, 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 you should have just sent people home. And uh, this is the kind of thing that I find so disturbing. You know, it's just yeah. you can't even trust an appointed teacher to be able to give the basic instructions, right? And you hear a lot of appointed teachers sort of on the side. They, you know, they they will make recommendations to people lately. It seems like they're sort of shifting out of that paradigm or some, at least some of them are, um, where, you know, if somebody's coming to them with a trauma response or something and like, you know, what do I do? And just, just, to, just observe, right, is not really sufficient for, yeah. for them um i feel i've heard some teachers recommending books like sort of subtly on the side you know about trauma and, and this sort of thing but mm. yeah i think the boilerplate response of just witness it as it is can be a bit um mm. uh, what would you say like undermining of it or uh, almost like gaslighting it a little bit sometimes yeah. even though there's profound truths in that but you know i think you have to meet people where they are yeah. Where they're out on the path like for, for me in my experience there was so much reactivity and i was trying so hard to you know like i'm really earnest about applying this technique and just witnessing as rising and passing away and yeah. like but if, if i was being honest i was just so in this cyclone of reactivity initially where like um, that just wasn't enough and i, I probably would have been it would have been much more yeah. apt to recommend some integration work you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think. Uh, well, one thing I'll say, like, I, I definitely didn't have PTSD going into the past, and I was probably somewhere like in the middle. Mm. You know, the the range, you know, in in the population in terms of 
let's say trauma load, right? And no mm-hmm. big stories to reference, you know, and uh, wasn't even very aware of having anxiety or depression, although I'd had a history of that for about three years prior. But, you know, going into it, uh, you know, it it drives up a lot of tension, right? You know, when you're mm-hmm. there. And like that to me is that that trauma is being driven up. But I don't think that that Vipassana really does much at all to actually cycle it out. So it kind of gets mm-hmm. driven up. And then you're basically, you know, given the instructions to, you know, do your best to be equanimous, to be have equanimity around it. Mm-hmm. And for me, I had a lot of energetic stuff going on too that got unleashed in that first course and then subsequent courses as well. So more pressure coming up, like uncomfortable energy pooling in the upper body. And I see this all the time. Mm, And for me, I had, you know, terribly painful TMJ. So just like just touching my jaw, like was painful. And, uh, I would say I probably, I, I I know I rank really high on the conscientiousness in the big five. I have a feeling mm. you do too. So, you know, mm. did my absolute best, you know, to follow the instructions, right? And mm. But mm. for me in the course, it's like this became, you know, just uh, so like uh, much of a, a painful situation to try to navigate uh, because more pressure, more energy was getting released right just kind of like pulling up here more tension and of course like a lot of grinding teeth at night too just did a number on my teeth um and it of course you know during the retreat you you do experience like i got i think very very competent with the technique and you know and i was even getting into jhana states which guanka says are basically lost the world it's not even true you know but it's part of one of the discourses um Mm. so you know i got uh, I mean, I was doing my best to follow the instructions, but I really think like you're just spinning your wheels in terms of, of trauma, you know? It's, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And j- just for context, so you, you went to Vipassana treats over the span of 14 years is, would you say that's accurate? Yeah. yeah. See, I haven't done clear, definitely not that much. Like I, I think I, you know, I was my Vipassana sort of uh, episode went for about, um, maybe two and a half years where I went from, you know, I, I did uh, two retreats as a, as a student and then um, one as a male manager, which God, I don't know why the hell they picked me. I was like the most sensitive, like neurotic person in the whole world for that. Yeah. But yeah. like, uh, yeah, <laughs> but at that time, at least, right. Um, that's just what I was feeling and I didn't know how to make sense of it. Um, and yeah. a lot of stuff was still bubbling up for me, but also very earnestly taking it out. Like from the first retreat, I would take it out into daily life. And I was you know, doing like two hours a day without fail. So, yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, the, a lot of that energetic reg- uh, stuff bubbling up was yeah. quite, quite intense. That's for sure. It, it was sort of like, oh, I could go into it. It would dissolve. And then it would just sort of recomposite in a different area of the body. That's right. And the hot, it was sort of this warm sort of gushy feeling that would just recomposite elsewhere. And, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know if that was dissolving it. Like I know people like Frank Yang, for instance, say like the personalizing your sensations can actually be quite an effective means of releasing trauma. But yeah, for me, it was, um, yeah, it wasn't that helpful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I even had moments where, let's say, you know, you experience like the tension completely dissolving, right? Yeah. Pain- oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, many times. And it just feels like, oh, this is it. You know, I'm done with this, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? No more yeah. reactivity, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I, yeah. Can I show you something uh, which yeah, I love to show people? Mm. Uh, do you see this? Um. Yes, I do. Damage? Yeah. I, you know what? I don't know the artist who did this image and I found it. Uh, I think it was like somebody in Eastern Europe with, with mm-hmm. that didn't speak English. And I, so anyway, but I love to show this to people because um, I think it really helps a lot to understand, you know, um, what, what we're up against. Um, yeah. 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 That's so awesome. yeah, this, this figure on the left, this is an artist representation of Wilhelm Reich's seven belts of tension. So mm. Is that name familiar to you, Dr. Wilhelm? No, 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 actually. That's not he's, hearing it. Yeah, he's considered widely the father of body-oriented psychotherapy. So Reikian therapy, oh. uh, he, I think he died in, I don't know, it could have been like the early 60s. Interesting guy. 
um, absolutely brilliant. Um, and he was a student of Sigmund Freud, and he was the first of the analysts who wasn't, you know, it's like he departed from the talk therapy model and got interested in what is all this chronic tension about. So he mm -hmm. made that his area of focus and what he came to, um, you know, to, to learn like his, this, these tension belts are universal where they show up. So that's the ocular belt, the eyes that actually comes from the occipital ridge, uh, that ocular mm -hmm. belt. By the way, that's an interesting one to know if you're interested in waking or meditation, because a lot of it's it's pretty it's pretty difficult to have a silent mind if you've got tension in the occipital um, ridge. Just something practical to know. Um, okay. And the that that's the oral belt. I had loads of tension there. Um, the cervical belt or the throat, the thoracic belt, the diaphragmic belt the sacral belt and the pelvic belt. And so, you know, basically what that is, this is this chronic tension represents freeze in the body. And this starts pretty early in life, like the, like the earliest weeks and months of our life. So you can think of it like this. Like, have you ever, have you ever watched a young baby, like six months old cry? Yes. And so you really, what you see in a baby is that it's like the whole body is feeling these intense sensations. You can just tell just watching them, right? Oh, yeah. And if that, if if a baby cries too long, okay, and the caregiver doesn't come and pick up the child, what will happen is the baby will cross, they will, they will go up that sympathetic activation and they will come to a threshold where nature steps in and they go into a freeze response. So mm. if you were to observe the baby, the baby might look like it's calming down, like it's, it's starting to doze off, okay? Stops yeah. crying. But yeah. what's happening is um, this musculature here, typically like in the thoracic belt and the diaphragmic belt are squeezing. And it's just helping the baby to mm. get through this experience. Now, eventually, let's say the caregiver comes along and picks up the baby. What you would expect to see is the baby would start crying and probably like over maybe the next 20, 30 minutes or even more, you would see the baby crying and then shake and shudder. And it would kind of be kind of like off and on, cry, shake, shudder, right? Mm. Uh, and that is basically shaking out that freeze response, right? Ah, oh, right. The natural now, response that the body has at an innate young age, right? To shake. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like we learn to repress and reject and it's like not socially conditioned. We're born with this shaking mechanism. In fact, this is, you know, the, on a daily basis, babies in utero shake, right? It's just yeah. part of it. You know? If I can add to that just briefly, and I'll, I'll love to keep hearing this, but um, when I was with my ex-partner, she had a, you know, I had a stepdaughter that I was looking after. And I think you said in Angelo's interview that we sort of learned to repress this uh, mechanism, this innate mechanism of shaking. Yeah. Um, but there was one night where I noticed Alice, she was struggling to get to sleep and, you know, Talia had a really big day, my ex-partner, really big day. And she was really stressed and, you know, Alice just was struggling to fall asleep. Um, and I think she just felt a bit of like energetic transmission maybe from, from Talia that she just didn't have it in her at that day. She was just at the end of a rope sort of thing and just wanted to go to sleep and, she couldn't sleep um, and Alice couldn't sleep. And I remember I went in after just to support her, just to help Taylor out, just to support her fall asleep. And she was shaking. Like she was like really violently, you know, like she was like yeah. shivering, like actually yeah. having a, um, yeah, like she was shivering as if she was cold. And I, and I just, I knew then I'm like, wow, she is just, that is the body discharging that stress. And that's, that's beautiful. And I just was just able to support her and just let her know that, yeah, it's okay. Like, I'm here and yeah. just give, give us some touch and some warmth. And, um, but yeah, just witnessing that firsthand was quite powerful for me to see. Right. And she's like, it's, and she even said it herself. She's like, this is just what my body does when I'm, when I'm feel stressed and, um, you know, mommy's not giving me love or something. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. We repress okay. that. We repress yeah. that mechanism. I know. Oh my I God. Know. Yeah. 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 And, I'm sorry, I cut you off. You, yeah, you, you no, that's me. oh, thank you for saying that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. But you, you probably know about attachment theory. Um. Mm, yes. You know, yeah. 
So we know, like it's estimated, about half of all adults have some some degree of attachment disorder going on. And that's really pointing to this early childhood developmental traumas, particularly in the first year, right? Mm. And, you know, it's really something, um, uh, you know, we, we, we don't want to kind of, uh, we want to appreciate that the nervous system, it's, it's really trying to help us. It's trying to help us to, um, number one, to be able to have the energy to navigate stressful times, to have the energy to kind of, you know, run or fight if needed. Mm. But it also, that capacity to go into a freeze is also a blessing too. Because the alternative could be the stabilization, you know? Mm. So it's it's not, we should have some appreciation, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And what I always point clients to when doing somatic inquiry is to look at the utility of it and actually to trust your intuition to allow it to surface. You know, a lot of the time it's trying to keep you safe, like an energetic contraction that is withholding your voice from speaking you know, it's like, it's, it's keeping me validated, but obviously there's deeper, um, you know, like physiological reasons as well. Um, yeah. but like dysregulation, complete dysregulation, if you didn't have that contraction perhaps, or something like that. So, and that can actually invite more of a heartfelt appreciation. It's like, oh, wow. You know, you almost like you can start to thank your body when it has these contractions in a way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So then the other thing I will point out is the psoas muscle, which is that's the fight or flight muscle that's located in, you know, the, the pelvic area. <clears throat> that's the largest muscle in the body. And it's kind of interesting to know, like a lot of people who struggle with tension up here, for example, like the jaw, like I did, for example, these mm -hmm. belts up here, that, that tension is really coming from the pelvis. So that mm -hmm. psoas muscle. And um, so it's designed to contract, to release its adrenaline, you know, if there's a real danger. But people who study stress physiology say that the average, the average person in a Western urban area is having their body squeeze in some fashion more than 200 times a day. That's a nervous system that's really gone awry, right? So the average person, right? average person so it's expressed oh. as i know i know it's crazy and and most of the time people are quite oblivious to it you know so mm -hmm. it, it can be you know just tensing the jaw you know um contractions that are happening in the diaphragm in the pelvis in the legs for example like it's just the, it's like the body is just squeezing itself all day long right mm -hmm. and you know i i somehow got through the past now like i just didn't wasn't really kind of observing that like it was it's so much about pinpointing the sensations right mm, yeah um, right well yeah. actually funnily enough it's so uh, amazing that you mentioned that the psoas muscle is connected to the occipital sorry what the uh the top one the um ocular band did you say the ocular belt ocular belt yeah, because I, I've actually noticed that so many times experientially, you know, just diving into sensations in the in the gut. If I if I just rest attention right into the, the the tightness and the contraction of the gut, I can feel the energy. And I've always I've always kind of just picked that up. That I'm just quite sensitive to it. I can feel how it recomposites and actually moves up to the head. So if I feel that if I feel the tightness in the psoas muscle or the gut, often I feel like a tension that again, recomposites into the jaw or something like that yeah. after it dissolves a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you're, and you're, are you saying that that is sort of a response or an adrenal response of some sort that is releasing like a stress hormone that, uh, yeah, how, how would you describe that? Uh, well, uh, I would describe it as like that energy is being like, it's coming from the lower body, right. And traveling mm. up that energy is going up, uh, and that is all like, I can't really talk very much, very specifically about it, yeah. but other than to say that if we're just trying to relax the jaw or relax, you know, the occipital ridge, like it's just not going to happen if we've got crazy amount of contraction going on um, in the psoas muscle. Mm, yeah, I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. What I what I love about this illustration is the 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 yoga model, the seven chakra model next to it, mm -hmm. because it's so uh, interesting how the chakras 
you know, more or less line up directly with uh, Wilhelm Reich's Seven Belts of Tension. And if you've ever studied yoga, a lot of the yoga traditions put a lot of emphasis on the root chakra, that it's understood if there's excess tension in that part of the body, it's going to be very difficult for the spiritual aspirant to make progress. You have to keep in mind, you know, yoga, really the aim of yoga was self-realization. That's... <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. that's ultimately what it was. And so there's a recognition that there is the subtle body. There is the, this energy in the body that it does. There's emotion that's, you know, kind of bound up and that, uh, that, that fear is largely stored in that psoas muscle. So, mm -hmm. and we see that too in, in TRE that, when people are, you know, coming to TRE and they're starting, you'll you'll typically see a lot of the shaking happening in that psoas muscle and the legs. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of reasons why. Like it's those are the largest muscles in the body, but it's where a lot of fear is stored too. And mm -hmm. I would say from you know a psychological, emotional perspective, getting that tension out um, can be really quite profound for people. Yeah, absolutely. I notice whenever those, um, you know, and for full transparency, um, sometimes, you know, I still deal with a lot of contraction in the gut, actually, lately in the past couple of weeks, especially, I attribute it to, and I'm, I'm, that's why I'm so excited to pick your brain on this as well. Because, I, you know, I do somatic inquiry in it, I can feel it release. But I'm also keen to sort of bring a more integrative approach where, you know, you're also just appreciating the physical uh, component and sometimes the body just might need to move or, or stretch and, and shake. And how can we, how can we activate that? Which maybe we can get into, but the, yeah. um, yeah, the, I notice whenever that tension, especially in the gut opens up and there's a softening and a relaxation of that, um, things, even from an insight approach, just feel like I can just relax in beingness so much easier mm. without the mind going in, you know, into thought, into the, into the body, into thought, into the body, into reactivity. Huh. But if, if the, if things are open and um, yeah, that, that it yeah. just feels so much easier to bring a clearer discernment. It's like uh, the difference between looking through a foggy piece of glass versus a, a diamond like clear glass in a way, you know? Yeah. Mm. You know, equanimity is so huge here. You know, it really mm. is. You know, equanimity is something like we experience at the bodily level, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think that that contraction, like my perspective on it is, you know, there's, you know, this a contraction that is basically stuff that's just, you know, unprocessed emotion that goes back to very early in life. Like that chronic tension, I think is it's really important that that be thoroughly dealt with. And then I think, uh, you know, in addition to that, we've got this, you know, you could say like, you know, restless energy contraction that's coming from, you know, that feeling of being separate, right? Vulnerable, you know, mm -hmm. I think like that is like another aspect to this. And then a third aspect I would say too, is that, you know, even when we've gone very, very deep into the realization process, uh, we're still doing crazy things to our body, you know, like um, sitting in front of a computer for hours on end, not getting enough mm. exercise, driving, you know, these things, you know, our bodies just didn't, you know, evolve to do. No. Now, I would say, like, I think, um, I don't know, I've never talked to Angelo about this, but I, I, I'm inclined to think that what happens is the body does just tend to soften up quite a lot. Um, mm. You know, I, I I think like if you can't soften the body up, um, it is going to be very difficult to get into deep stage realization. I don't know. This just is my own perspective, mm. looking at myself, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's beautiful because you have such a deeply informed view of that because it it does get subtler and subtler. And I think a lot of the times, and this has been my experience too, that as layers of identity and things like this peel off, there are, there are these like hidden agendas that you didn't even know were there. You know, like if I ask, if, if I had to ask a question that, like, what am I pursuing awakening for? And I really want to know with deep authenticity and congruency, which mm. can be totally humbling to the spiritual seeker who's done like five Vipassana retreats or something sometimes, but 
It's like, man, I'm just doing all this shit for validation or something like that, right? Like, I just want to be validated by other people Mm. or like, I just want to, um, you know, be more successful. And so I can be slightly above people with a heightened clarity of how the world operates. So I can be, you know, ascend in my career or something. And you see these things and it's like, what the hell? Like, I thought I wanted awakening. I thought I wanted to be free from suffering, but Uh I actually want to do it for like (laughs) Uh, um, validation and all these things. But yeah. Oh, and, and there's just so much I want to like die, like sort of talk about here as well, because um, first thing that came up was you mentioned equanimity, you know, and that term seems to me in pragmatic spheres and or in, even in Buddhist spheres in general, uh, or even just secular awakening practice, it seems to have like varying definitions from my understanding. Um in one sense, you could, could you say that equanimity is a state of relaxation without much energetic charge and turbulence in the body? Or you could also say it is, even if that's happening, there's there's like no resistance to that. Would you define that? How would, would you say my, would you talk about my, my own perspective is the first. Right, right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So I, I really tried the second one for first fourteen years. Uh, so you really what the second? One? I I really worked at the second one for fourteen years. You know. Ah, uh, okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So to try to, to try to have, have developed yeah. to cultivate equanimity, right, about suffering, right. So the suffering mm-hmm. can be here, but I'm gonna, I'm going to endeavor to be okay with it, right. Yes. I tried that. Oh so so much i put so much i invested so much to try to get that and now i relate to that as well (laughs) yeah you know it's kind of heartbreaking you know when you think a lot of people are are, you know thinking of it that way Mm. yeah i mean sometimes things there there are situations with the body that we can't do anything about you know sometimes somebody has an illness or they have like nerve pain or something and these things um i think uh you know, we have to accept that, like, sometimes, like, the body's just vulnerable to things like mm. that, right? Mm. Um, pain does get processed differently, you know, as you go deeper into this. There's no question about it. But, you know, my perspective on it, look, if there's, if there's like, restless energy, if there's contraction in the body, and we have some practical and efficient ways to get at that, like, why the hell not? Like, why why, why endeavor to yeah, just... Yeah, well, that's, the, that's a really good thing to point out is because I know if I put myself in the shoes of Sam, if I conjure up the story of Sam, go three years behind, I would have said, like, Chris, Gamond, what the hell are you talking about? Like, I need, I know I damn well need to, like get past craving and aversion and to what what you're describing that we need to soften the body and relax the body and that's going to lead to deeper spirit psycho spiritual unfoldment that seems to me to be like my, my mind would probably be doubtful of that being a trap or like that i'm craving a pleasant state of mind which the things like the goenka tradition can really reinforce right yeah so i'm curious how you um, reconcile that with your like huge amount of practice experience and and yeah. going into both worlds right yeah, yeah. You no, know, I, I I found this out, um, you know, toward the last few years that I was with Vipassana, I started to hear stuff from other, from people in other Buddhist traditions. And I started to hear that there were, uh, you know, other Buddhist traditions that looked at Vipassana as a, a, a brutalizing process. Mm. Did you wow. know that? Yeah. No. So there's different, like, so say like Tibetan Buddhism would look at Vipassana and maybe just as an example. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's is, like a mutilation in that sense, like that degree of what uh, you're talking yeah, about. Like it's, it's oh, unnecessary. Wow. It's brutal. Um, it's very arduous. Uh, I didn't know that. No. To, <laughs> and also like, I would say like the, maybe my single biggest critique of Vipassana is there, you're always kind of oriented that subject object, you know, I like yes. I am looking at my sensations, you know, I am endeavoring, endeavoring to have equanimity, right? You're never turning yes. to going, who is doing this process? And like, that is where it's at, in my opinion, if you really want right. to, uh, you know, be efficient with your time, do that, right? I agree so much, so deeply. I remember very distinctly, like I, being on a 10 day retreat and like the second retreat and stuff, like 
I, I actually remember energetically what that felt like is like, I'm in my head, like a lighthouse looking down, flashing my beam of attention onto these sensations, scanning part by part. And then when I started to actually get curious, just trusting my instinct and going into more like open awareness practices with a teacher, uh, Michael Taft. Yeah. Yeah. He's so good. I love him. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Then I started doing that and I'm like, what the hell? There's no, there's no one even doing that. Right. There's just the sensation you know, that's sort of self-aware of itself and just sort of slowly, yeah. but surely deconstructing that view and then just yeah. opening out awareness a lot more was just so powerful. Mm. So much more like yeah. ease and um, yeah. insight uh, could actually start to be appreciated through that lens. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I want to share something that, when I started working with Gary Weber, do you know anything about Gary? I know that you've worked with him, but no, I don't actually know him. I, I know that he points to investigating the the agent or, or like, um, I, again, I was just re-listening to your interview with Angelo and you briefly mentioned it, but yeah. Yeah, amazing teacher. He's about 80 now. And I worked with him for about three and a half years. And actually he told me that uh, he said that Vipassana wasn't really developed by the Buddha. Like the Buddha basically, you know, gave many different teachings, right? It wasn't just Vipassana, although you would never know that going to a Goenka retreat. You'd think that. <laughs> <laughs> the Satipatthana Sutta was the only thing he ever wrote, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what Gary said is, you know, the way to think about it, he said, is like the Vipassana like that, the you know, the body scanning, that was kind of like the the mindfulness of the ancient world. It was a technique developed for host holders to help them just to, you know, manage the vicissitudes of, you know, daily mm-hmm. life. It wasn't really uh meant to be like a pathway to liberation. It wasn't considered realistic for a host holder to attain liberation. And I think mm-hmm. it was much like, you know, John Cabot Zinn and you know, that whole, you know. Um, mindfulness approach, you know, it's mm-hmm. not, it's not really bringing the attention back and looking at the identity. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it can definitely help with stress, like for sure. Um, mm. it, it helped me with stress. Um, there was some emotional purging that happened. Um, how much I got out of that, I don't know. Like it's, it's hard to tell. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If, if I compare my practice experience from doing Vipassana and, and like, it's, it's tricky to talk about it in this way, because I think, it, you know, it's all part of the path. Like who the hell knows if I started with open awareness practice, maybe it would have sim- followed a similar path. And then I would have switched over to Vipassana when I finally realized that like, oh, maybe this isn't for me or something. I don't know. Like you can only theorize, but yeah, like the, um, yeah, it, it just, it wasn't doing what I was after essentially like the, um, but, but the sensations, I think like it, it felt more like this when I was doing the pass and it was like surfing a wave, you know, like I could feel there were still really intense waves a lot of the time and the reactivity had definitely dampened down and softened, mm. but it was, um, this, the, the contractions and the pull back into the reactivity with that was still quite intense for me. So mm um yeah (laughs) yeah yeah it was you know it was a different time when I started that was like 2001 you know I mean things have changed so much it's like breathtaking to see Mm. the information that's available now um Mm -hmm. how old are you Sam I'm curious uh 26 (laughs) 26 oh my god I love it I love it amazing (laughs) <laughs> there's a lot of um i think the younger generation is really sort of diving into a lot of this stuff now mm-hmm. you know like uh, i go to men's i go to men's retreats and a lot of the guys are like in their 50s and stuff and they're like well, what, what what how the hell are you here you know but uh, i don't know it's just it's nothing special about it really it's just there were just the causes and conditions lined up with through suffering to to yeah. just want to dive in and go deep so yeah uh, yeah <laughs> oh that's that's really awesome yeah 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 oh well, thank you uh. <laughs> yeah yeah but equanimity though yeah because that that vice that pull into wanting to um like you because i I just know that is so delicious like even somebody who's a diehard vipassana meditator who might you know listen to something like this or they would they would be like no like that 
they're delusional. <laughs> like yeah. I have, I have yeah. to get rid, like down to the root of reactivity, even if it means yeah. that I have to suffer and go through hell to get there um, yeah. to realize it. Right. Yeah. Well, you know what? I would, I would argue that um, if you take the approach of just focusing on the nervous system, like think of it from the perspective of like, we're born with this capacity to self-regulate our nervous system, but mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've, you know, suppressed it out. Right. But if we were just to kind of harness that to just clear the body of, you know, stress and trauma, right. It puts us in a vastly better place on a day-to-day -day level mm. to kind of mm. actually work in real time. Like you've got your, your, your body is like energetically open. You can, that um, introception, that felt sense of the inner body increases, right? So that you have now a real, a real fighting chance that when anything's happening that is of the nature, oh, I don't like this, like you have a chance to actually see the reaction formation in a much clearer way, right? Mm. And to work with it, see like, well, is this reaction doing anything to help? Like the person is just saying words or, or, you know, I'm, I'm stuck on the side of the highway with a flat tire and it's pouring rain. Is there any point in adding to the situation by getting upset, right? That yeah. brings that inquiry, like for me, like that, that kind of day-to-day -day inquiry, just looking like, you know, the, anything that felt like, of course, you know, it's like you kind of like deal with the bigger stuff, like the bigger reactions and that reactivity will fall off just from the awakening process alone. I think it's not about, you know, trying to kind of like work in the nitty gritty with, um, you know, attachment or aver aversion, like, you know, in a sense, mm -hmm. like the awakening process will, you know, cut down a lot on the reactivity. And it's kind of like, where you get to a point where it's like you're looking at a, a pond and the water is going lower and you can kind of see mm. the weeds, yes. you can see what's left, right? Yeah. And then to just see that, look, oh yeah, okay. Most of us can kind of, um, you know, the kind of things that get to us are, you know, more or less the same every day or every week, or, you know, we, know, we kind of know what they are, right? Mm -hmm. And then just to kind of come at that with some skillful means and, and interest, right? And um, I, I found this went so, so quickly. Well, I say quickly, like it took, um, you know, when I started with Gary, uh, it really took, I'm going to say probably two to three years, like it, it, the, the whole time, like say from the time I had done Thierry for about a year prior to meeting Gary. So that, that was like a really big watershed year. Mm -hmm. um, and then starting to work with him, really looking at beliefs, expectations, um, yeah. uh, looking at, you know, the things that were, were triggering me. And I'll tell you, like at that time, like my life was a roller coaster because I have, uh, like I said in the interview, my son, you know, we have mm -hmm. four adult kids and one of them fell into a pretty bad crack cocaine addiction. And mm -hmm. It was a nightmare, Sam. Like, I mean, uh, we almost lost him a couple of times. You know, he was in ICU on life support and didn't know if he was going to make it. Like, stuff like that, right? Oh, my God, um, yeah. And, you know, it was a terrible, terrible situation. And, uh, you know, my my husband and I, we have a beautiful relationship. But that period of our son's, you know, crack cocaine addiction, uh, that was like a worst period in our entire marriage by far because we really didn't agree, you know? So mm. there was like a lot of reactivity. Like I never was up against so much reactivity. Like this is like, okay, you know, this is like so much was going on. So it was like, I was seeing, um, you know, uh, he would disappear and, and the mind would go, oh, maybe it's the last time you're ever going to see him. And yeah, how did you right, see right. the signs? How did you not see the warning signs? Right. And yeah, just like, like blaming like, yourself a little bit. Yeah. And yeah. And really intense, like grief and like, like just, uh, anguish, very intense anguish. So, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. uh, I, I, I was going through a lot. Right. So I don't want to, you know, like you to think that I was like, things were pretty tranquil in my life. They were far from it. And that's, mm. you know, I started working with Gary, like the first probably a year and a half of it was, um, me, just being buffeted about on a daily basis with stuff like mm. that. Mm. <laughs> but, yeah. Wow. What, what jet uh, fuel, right? Like you're, you're yeah. bringing to him every oh, time yeah. you're going in, like a oh, wealth yeah. of beliefs, like, Hey, look, I've got this, I've yeah. got this, I've got yeah. this. 
yeah yeah you know in a way you can have a, it's like a reverence for that process too because it really shows you the depths of suffering i would imagine that really would have shown you right like wow this is oh. intense like, oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember sitting you know in in intensive care you know you know you uh unit you know at my son's bedside he's on a you know uh in a drug-induced coma on a ventilator and mm. and it was just like uh, absolutely awful like and just not knowing is he going to even know who he is when he comes out of this um mm. and you know doing a lot of self-inquiry like who is it that's suffering right mm. looking at the like the pain the physical pain the anguish right Wow, and, the mind's creating a story um, of past and yeah. future and like yeah. blaming yeah. yourself and being like, yeah. you know, I'm this terrible person. Mm -hmm. But then you could just come, you're just coming back to the presence of this moment and like, who's even yeah. suffering, right? Yeah. That's such powerful practice. Yeah. 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 And then what's amazing is like that whole situation just kind of resolved itself so beautifully. Mm -hmm. It was incredible uh, where, you know, he, recovered from the addiction it's going to be six years in january and mm -hmm. he's like almost like you know um the you know the, the poster child of of you know what can happen through you know recovery like it's it's beyond <laughs> recovery sam like you know i think like a lot of people in recovery it's it's about still trying to get through the day right mm -hmm. there's still kind of like a lot of fixation right going on or the pain that was driving the addiction in the first place right yeah yeah and, yeah 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 but yeah. he's just this beaming light now or like you know obviously yeah. he's probably he's probably yeah. got his moments but yeah oh yeah i'm so happy for you that's great what a journey right <laughs> wow. yeah and he's he's been going through the awakening process himself since about 2018 great great how old is he now he is in his early 30s okay cool yeah yeah Oh, that's great. Is he doing like a pasana retreats or like self inquiry or? Well, he's into Muji. <laughs> oh, he's, Muji, he's yeah, into yeah, yeah. Muji and Douglas Harding, that combination, yeah. Oh, the headless way, yeah, great. Oh, good yeah. for him. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's so... interesting because, like, trying to solve his addiction problems, it was interesting. That's how I ended up stumbling onto TRE, right? And it was yes. kind of being told by a therapist, look, you know you're going to have to get to what was setting him up for the addiction or otherwise he'll never be stable. You know? mm -hmm. He'll always be at risk. Mm. Yeah. So there's a really interesting overlap there, I think. So in one sense, we can deal with the content when processing trauma, we can dive into it and we can, I like to really work with this. You can call it a model, but um, sort of like, have, bringing the wisdom traditions into the the self inquiry process, where as you you know you can dilate your attention outward, and there's just this place of unknowing and intuition that can be um, re inhabited or brought to the foreground in a way, and that's sort of punctuating the experience of self inquiry, where mm -hmm. it's like thoughts can arise that feel like they're of the past and the future but you're not really treating them as if like, this is me, this is who I am. It's more of a, an appreciation and a reverence and we can give meta to it and things like that. Like, okay, that's great. That's there. And we can honor it and then just allow it to release from the body and actually physically allow it to release mm -hmm. as it happens. But you could also say that that's bringing up content and it might reify a story of like um, who I am. Right. So when we bring in the awakening component, that isn't really happening. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. that isn't really happening at all. Um, yeah. But yeah. in a sense, it is in a in a sort of paradoxical way, in my experience. Mm -hmm. But what what I think is cool about TRE. Are you following, by the way? Does that do you feel like yeah. you can resonate with that? Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But with TRE, it seems like we're not really welcoming in the story. And I've actually had a client mention to me that she's she's interested in TRE, but she's actually worried that in doing TRE, she's not really honoring the deeply repressed parts of herself. And she wonders that, like, is there is there something? Yeah. I'm just curious as, as to what you would say to that, a person who might have a concern like that. Yeah. You know, like, because uh, it's like, if I don't address this story, you know, like, I know I have some stuff that's happened to me. And if I just shake it off physically, is that still going to get the same degree of resolve that in long lasting, you know, integration that I'm looking for? Right. 
I, 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 that's exactly how I see it. You know, um, let's say for example, like somebody has got a story that feels like I, I have to find my way to forgive somebody. Right. Mm, mm, that's a yes. common one. Right. And it might feel like, okay, I can deal with the somatic side of it, but I still got like that, you know, that story that feels like it needs some resolution. Um, I don't see it that way. I feel like, okay, if you just deal with the body side of it, like the whole need to come to some sort of understanding, you know, forgiveness, I think that just falls away. Mm, mm. As insight deepens, right? Yeah. 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 Right, so it's just purely a physical thing in uh, through through what you do as you as you approach it through the lens of awakening. It's like the body is this vehicle that is essentially there to so it's in service of spiritual awakening, which I think a lot of people who would be watching a video like this they they would honor and appreciate. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I think like you know, Terry. I mean, it really was the first. Well, I mean, it's in that lineage of body-oriented psychotherapy mm. uh, because David Bersali was, um, you know, he was basically trained in bioenergetics. Bioenergetics was Alexander Lowen. Uh, mm. Alexander Lowen, you know, a medical doctor too, by the way, who mm. uh, was, uh, you know, basically the person who carried on Reich's ideas and made them kind of more mainstream, developed them. Mm. And you know, uh, David basically, you know, had a lot of insight from bioenergetics uh, and just, you know, it was, you know, with that background and just, I mean, he's just an incredibly brilliant and curious person and just observing people, right? Mm -hmm. And particularly adults and children in extreme situations that he came to figure this out, that mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, realizing wow i think i think we've uh misunderstood the shaking mechanism what it's for you know mm. uh anyway it's very interesting i don't know if you know the story about that um but no no i don't he was um well there's about three events but the main one he was in a building in lebanon i think it was an embassy building or was it in lebanon or maybe anyway i can't remember which country mm. but there were i think a, maybe about 30 people and the this is a place that there was a civil war and so the the building that they were in was being shelled so when you have mortar shells hit a building it doesn't take the whole building out but it like will punch a hole through a brick wall right mm. so you had you know i know something like a couple dozen adults and children uh going to the basement which was the safest place to be and a lot of these people didn't speak the same language and so what the adults did is they just set themselves up on the floor around the perimeter of the room. And then the adults took the children onto their laps and they were there for hours. And, mm -hmm. and apparently it was just terrifying. Like every time a mortar bell mortar uh, would hit the building, it would just create just, you know, just a incredible um, sound, you know, it's just terrifying. Right. Mm -hmm. And what he saw was that, uh, and you're also oh, not sure, like that could be the thing that kills you, and, and you, it's just oh. totally coming out of nowhere every oh, time. Oh yeah, yeah. Terrifying. Yeah, and so what he saw was every single time that the the, the mortar shell would hit the building, the adults would contract their body and curl forward. So they're like sitting with their back against the wall, their legs stretched out. The adults would contract and move forward, all in unison. He saw it just like it was like almost like choreography, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody, right? Mm -hmm. But the children weren't doing that. The children were just shaking like a leaf. Okay. And then he, so this went on for hours. And then he noticed after that the kids seemed to be doing better than the adults. And, and he said, he said to a couple of the adults, he says, you know, I noticed that you didn't shake, you know, can you tell me why? And they said, well, we didn't want the children to think we were afraid. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So he was in the, was he being shelled with them? Yeah. He was there. Yeah. Was he shaking? Or oh, you don't know? I don't think he was I don't think he was shaking. I think he was no, and he no. he said he had two two small kids on his lap. He noticed that they were shaking as well. But it was oh just Oh my god. There really, you go. Was, yeah. There you go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> by, by the way, Angelo interviewed him on Monday and oh, that no way. interview is going to be posted maybe today or tomorrow. And Angelo Great. sent me 
uh, he said this might have been the most extraordinary interview he's done yet. Oh and my God! I can't wait. Oh, yeah. delighted! I have I'll to be watching you. that. Yeah, yeah. It was it was really really extraordinary. He was deeply deeply impressed. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Great. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So in one sense, there's this potential to honor the story, but there might be a suggestion that really a lot of that can be done just by. Um, Ultimately, I think it's just whatever works for people, right? Yeah. It's like for, for regulating the nervous system, I think if we can appreciate that, look, like we have the opportunity to release stress. Yeah. Uh, we have the opportunity to, um, and the tools are there. Yeah. And if we want to wake up in this lifetime, why not just use them? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why not recruit the body's innate intelligence that's already Absolutely. there? Absolutely. I know. Yeah. I know. We just save yeah. ourselves a whole lot of time. And yeah, stress. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I think I think what I notice, um, what's been really powerful doing somatic inquiry with people as well, is it gives you access to various points in in the in the nervous system that otherwise feel like they're just really frozen and stuck. And it, it actually, I, I noticed all of the time in my experience, it, once you connect to the, with the theory with somatic inquiry would be that you connect to the right words that are sort of associated to that sensation. And there's like a lock and key mechanism that happens. And yeah. that actually often for me uh, is very, and I'm very energetic. Like I, I it, it initiates the shaking. It actually like initiates that, um, that, that reaction to ignite where then the body can then release and do what it needs to do that it would otherwise have normally done in the situation to then release uh, mm. that energy and just bring about more regulation. Mm. So, but I'm, um, yeah, I'd love to, and you know, after this, I'd love to probably book a couple sessions with you to, to, to learn it as well, just to get a, get a grapple on it, to see how they overlap and um, complement yeah. each other. Yeah. 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 It's, it's pretty interesting, you know, um, I've actually seen Thierry trigger awakening in somebody that wasn't interested in it. Uh, and wow, okay. Yeah, uh, interesting story. Um, but uh, yeah, I won't go into it right now, but mm. David Berselli, I think he's saying in the interview that he's seen this countless times. I've, I've talked to David a number of times. Mm. But I think it's kind of like this. It's kind of like you uh, are so habituated to feeling a certain way in your body, right? And when there's anything that kind of releases a lot of energy. It could be going and doing ayahuasca in Peru, right? A, a lot of things that we could do, 10 days of Hasana, it's another kind of extreme experience, right? Yeah, the holy grail of self-help, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of things, you know, have the potential to trigger awakening. And, um, mm. and you know, I've, I've seen it, I've seen it with my own eyes, you know, with, with TRE. Um, it's so interesting. And I think, I think there are people, I told Angela this, um, there's people I think that it's actually triggered that first shift. These are people that have not had a background in spirituality or traditions of any kind. Mm. And then it just triggers that, that, you know, that first shift. And then because it's so efficient with the emotion work part of it, right? Which is like the, that's the thing that kind of is needs to be dealt with. We want to move on to deeper stages of realization, right? We've got to get through that stuff. And yeah. you know, when you talk to people in the global TRE community, you'll hear things like, uh, you know, there's, you know, uh, I've been doing TRE for, for 10 years now. And, um, I, it's, it's at a place now I can't really talk about it. It's something mm. really profound has happened, but I cannot find the words to say what it is, but. And, and what do you think is happening for those people uh, when that's yeah, happening, you know, with this awakening, because, uh, for me, what I can imagine might, what might be going on is, you know, you're so, I mean, who, like who the hell knows, right? Who like, it's for everyone's different, but if you're doing these and I would love to, I, I really want to see how you teach it and how you do it too, to, to understand it uh, deeply. But if you're doing these TRE exercises, right, you're stretching, you're, um, or you're allowing that shaking mechanism to, to engage it. I would imagine it puts you so immediately in the sensory experience and perhaps might even be clearing out some of the energy that there's more of a stillness to your mind or. Oh, oh might, yeah. Yeah. Which might open up a, a window of realization of like, wow, who am I? Or what is yes. this? Or, yes. Yeah. Um, I've seen people kind of sit up and just 
uh, sit and and just want to be silent for 30 minutes. And I think what mm. it is, like, it's like that the mind can just go so quiet. And mm. it's like that for a lot of people, that's a pretty novel experience. Like, oh, mm -hmm. like there's something here, even though there's no thought, right? Mm -hmm. And just, it's so novel, like, right? So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, you could call that the um, I am sense, right? Just that yeah. abiding and beingness without there being much movement of mind. And it's like, what is this background yeah. of experience when yeah. I'm not referencing any, like a self or like all of my issues or my problems or my reactivity that keeps on going and referencing the sensations and worrying about them and reacting to them. And yeah. when it, when it, that's just calmed down and there's just the sensation or there's just that beingness and yeah. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not fundamentalist about TRE by, by any means, you know, mm. I don't imagine that like there's everybody needs to do TRE or mm. they're not, you know, I don't have that attitude. Okay. But my attitude is this, that, you know, it, it can be really interesting for just about anybody who's on this path to check it out, you know, just, yeah. just check it out and see, is this doing any, does this have the potential to do something to help you? Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Because, yeah it's a, it can really come across that way in the way that we've been speaking about it. It could be this like holy grail that's going to the silver ball that's going to yeah. fix all of the energetic yeah. regulatory issues yeah. or something. But um, yeah, I think I think it comes down to trusting yourself. And I think and as well, um, yeah, it's quite quick to learn. Right. Like it's yeah. it's really yeah. quite easy to yeah. learn. Oh, yeah. I've got a dog coming in the background. There, so. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is. A... Let's have a look at him. Oh, hey, buddy. Is Polly. that a guy? It's Holly, oh hey, sweetheart. Hello. <laughs> hey, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. hello. Yeah. Uh, I was just puppy sitting the other day and they're just such a oh, I love dogs yeah. so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you're a lucky, lucky woman to have that little Holly <laughs> next year. <laughs> dogs like shake, dogs that. do TRE yeah. all the time, don't they? They do. They do. Yeah. <laughs> they're a good teacher. Yeah. Uh -huh. I want to circle back to something that, you know, mm. uh, you were talking about earlier, you know, and working with people, you know, and people, you know, uh, the kind of work that you do. And I would say I'm I'm all for that kind of work with somebody one on one. And I think that it's a, a very valuable component for people. For a lot of people, they're they're going to have a tough time, even with something like TRE, if it's mm. on their own. Right. And I think um, it took me quite a while to realize that not everybody can do TRE that has, let's say, nervous system dysregulation. Not mm -hmm. everybody can just, you know, learn this technique, go off on their own and be able to do it. And I think what's mm -hmm. uh, what the difference is, I, I don't know, Sam, like because I meet some people who've been through a lot are quite dysregulated. They seem to be able to take TRE and just do very well on their own. And then other people who don't seem to have, you know, as much uh, going on, have a harder time. Uh, and what is that? I don't know. Like some people, I think, just need that support from another human being. Uh, yeah, the capacity for somebody just holding space for you actually is remarkable. You know, I've done a lot of uh, men's work retreats and this sort of thing. And just to be witnessed by somebody in a in an act of self-processing it's a, you know, we're social creatures and it just seems to bring forth this allowance energetically in the body that for things to come up and out a lot more when you're just being witnessed and allowed to be as you are. Like yeah. I'll give an example, just on a recent retreat I was at, I went to a um, three day gathering, uh, just intuitively went, decided to go and I uh, was sitting in a circle and we do like check-in rounds where you just check in with how you're feeling, um, you know, and just be honest in, within the confines of a safe space in a circle. No one's trying to fix you. Nobody's saying that your experience is wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was just feeling, I, I'd just done a workshop and I was just feeling like frustrated and I was around a lot of people and just pent up with angst, like just some people pleasing tendencies were coming on and I was just feeling frustrated and just feeling everything. And I could just check in at the circle with a group of guys witnessing me, you mm -hmm. know, and just say like, I'm just feeling so fucking frustrated right now. And 
you know, I just hate the fact that I'm, I have to, you know, this, these workshops just feel so shallow and like, I'm not getting anything out of it. And it just feel, and, and just to be so honest and just have people witness that it's like, it just moves through, then it's gone. And it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> right. That's what that emotion yeah. would say if it had a voice and then it's gone. And you know, yeah. so that, that act of someone holding space and just, just allowing whatever's there is so profound. Yeah, truly, even if someone's had a lot of experience and is like, like a psychiatrist for 40 years, just to have somebody hold space for them and yeah, process is, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I'm glad to hear you've got this men's group. Like this is really awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But with TRE, right. So you notice some people tend to struggle with it and you're not really sure what that is. Um. I have a feeling that it is because um, maybe the trauma was just uh, the wounding is so deep that it's very hard for them to do this on their own. I think like, especially when you see things like um, people who've had like early childhood, you know, uh, sexual abuse, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, this is really difficult. You know, it's like, you know, the crime scene is a person's own body, right? It's Mm. just such a deep violation of trust and everything, right? Just massively, massively confusing. Mm -hmm. And then to have that person to try to kind of, in a way, like when we're doing TRE, there's something, uh, some part of us knows, like we're, we're digging into something that was difficult. And Mm. even though like, it's not like we're it's really rare that people have like a feeling like, oh God, like this is like a, or even like a big cathartic experience. It's more, it's pretty gentle actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, like people will say, you know, oh, it's, you know, it actually feels enjoyable. And I, I feel like I had a really great massage after, mm-hmm. but nevertheless, I think there's something in our psyche that if there's like a lot of, uh, you know, especially like that kind of early childhood, you know, trauma, that it's kind of like we want to get as far away from it as possible. We don't want to turn and go toward it, you know, mm-hmm. even if it is something like this. Um, I know in in Canada on the West Coast, there was a nurse. I don't know if she's still, still doing this set right now, but she was offering weekly groups for uh, people who had, you know, been molested as children to come and just work as a group. I think that is the kind of thing that a lot of people would benefit from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah, support. We're we're social creatures, right? Absolutely. You don't have to. You don't have to do it all alone. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you have, you have a wellness center, don't you? Are you at your? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it, you know. Uh, yeah, 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 Fair enough. yeah. Don't yeah. Need much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. I'm, I, yeah I so you're you're doing awakening facilitation as well at the moment, I believe. With I saw on your website and. Yeah. And you sort of bring in that that wealth of practice experience. I'll um if we put this on YouTube, I'll put a, a, all your links at the top so people can like I refer to p- people to you as well. Like uh, I refer to a couple people to you because I just yeah that combination of energetic regulation along with the awakening facilitation process is just so like so needed. I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, another thing I'm doing, I'll just mention is uh, I've started doing group TRE sessions online and I'm not charging anything for them. And this is, you know, basically the Simply Always Awake community, any, anybody who can join. Hmm. Uh, Although I'm trying to figure out numbers wise, because I'm trying to limit the groups to 20 right now. I'm going to do one for people in Australia pretty soon because I've been promising them. Uh, Maybe I'll do it like Friday night here and it'll be Saturday morning. In cool, cool. I'll have I to like come to, along. Yeah, I like to I like to kind of sprinkle in a bit of theory every time because I think the theory is really practical. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Is there any other good pieces of information that you would usually share with people that you would feel open to sharing here? Like you you just you showed the um that model yeah, um, yeah. which is really powerful. Even just for me looking at it, right? I'm like, wow, that's yeah, of course. Yeah. Like yeah. those nuances of like the psoas belt connected to the ocular uh, region and stuff like that. Yes. It's just yeah. really insightful. It's very practical stuff to know, right? Mm. Mm. Um, I like there's a there's a uh, polyvagal theory, very simple, a uh, simplified yeah. explanation. I love. I'm aware. I yeah. To, yeah, I try to 
educate people on this as just like, it's just a useful thing to familiarize yourself, to get acquainted with so that it's usefulness is that you should, you should be able to identify at any one time, like, where am I in this? Okay. Hmm. And to understand that, look, um, you know, where you want to kind of like try to get your nervous system down most of the time is that that ventral vagal, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's really, you know, where we're supposed to be, you know, biologically. And um, mm-hmm. very few people are, you know, even people into awakening, like they're still up in that sympathetic activation or, and I see a lot of people, interestingly, who have, uh, they're definitely well into the awakening process and they're up in that dorsal vagal. Like, it's just like, mm-hmm. you know, I think the awakening itself will, you know, it will, um, you know, weaken those, let's say the defenses that keep that trauma buried, you know, and right. We're taking the lid off the yes. you know, pit of snakes in a way, right? Yeah. yeah. So people might not have any kind of explicit memories or anything like that coming up, but just like a feeling of overwhelm or anxiety or shame or whatever. And it's just yeah, yeah. too much. And then they end up going up into that dorsal vagal response Mm -hmm. very difficult to do anything productive there right Mm -hmm. and then to try to get them to come down right they're going to have to pass through that sympathetic like high sympathetic activation and a lot of people get caught here where you know the interpretation can be oh god like i'm feeling so anxious you know they don't realize like that you have to feel that anxiety you have to get you know through that to come down right yes yes yeah yeah, yeah, it's like awakening when you open up the space of consciousness just through beingness and stuff like that. It's like take it can sometimes like take off the lids. And uh, Angelo talks about that a lot with, yeah. um, you know, the more that you open up consciousness, the more that you give permission for repressed material to surface into your experience. Yeah. And that's what I, you're noticing a lot of people are probably dealing with. Yes. So, I, so you you just said that they it you actually need to feel that, but it's like how can we maybe um, you know, smoothen yeah. that process out to a degree so that you're not stuck there. You're not, you yeah. know, you, you can't go out and you're dysregulated in any social situation you get involved with or um, and these sorts of things, which is actually a possibility, which yeah. I, I think, unfortunately, things like if we're just hardcore drive a person or meditators might overlook, right. Or, yeah, um, or whatever, but it, it, there's a real possibility there. Um, so there's, there's TRE, you know, and and by the way, I relate to these these places because I I do I definitely still experience them, um, and I've had to learn my own modalities to uh, you know somatic inquiry has been profoundly useful for bringing me back down to the um, um, probably the, somewhere ventral. in the middle, yeah. yeah yeah or ventral vagal yes and and just more relaxed uh, where I can you know do work and I'm not in a heightened state of reactivity but also uh, qigong like I do a lot of qigong in the morning for like twenty minutes. Oh. Um, eight, eight brocades uh, practice um uh, exercise huge like i've been running like a madman lately i just wake up and i'll go for a you know 20 20 30 minute run or a bike ride and um yeah. these, are, these yeah. are all things i think people overlook right like uh, oh i i agree 100 yeah. percent. i think uh yeah like mm. you're, you're right like uh, some body practice is really really important uh yeah 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 because again, the mind can come in with like, but I have to get to the root of craving and aversion, right? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's okay yeah. to want to feel a little bit more ease. Yeah. I was yeah. so reactive after 14 years of pretty hardcore Vipassana, you know, and yet mm. I was getting into jhana states, incredible states of tranquility, you know, on mm. retreat, but mm. still so reactive identity, you know, still, you know, still like just, um, the identity had definitely taken, you know, a hit, you know, in that first mm. shift. But as you know, like the, that, you know, ego mind will come back again and again, trying to kind of like spin that story of separation, whichever way it can. Right. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I just didn't have any other, you know, useful means. Um, I think at a certain point I discovered Byron Katie, which was really good. I love Byron Katie, really love mm. Byron Katie. That inquiry, yeah. I was working with her whole worksheets for a yeah, while. I do the the work. She has an app as well. I was yeah. using as well. Yeah, yeah, it's good. But I found like a, just an abbreviation was like what really you know uh, became a game changer for me, and that was like you know um, how would it feel to let go of that this thought, 
It's mm. just so simple, right? But something that, you know, could be used, you know, it's just like to have something in your pocket that right there, right? Mm. Okay. There's that painful thought here. I'm ready. And it was just like right away, just go back, right? Away from that, you know, otherwise, you know, it's just like multiplying the thoughts trying to otherwise, um, you know, negotiate with them or understand them, you know? Yeah, yeah, or like push against them and use your spiritual practices that you've learned to try and like almost like eradicate them sometimes if you're being totally honest. Also, I want to mention I, I just signed up for the Awake 2024 retreat that you're doing in Kentucky. So I'll be coming over oh, from Australia. Okay. So okay. I'll, yeah, okay. I'll be able to yeah. meet you in person. Uh-huh. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is great. I'm really excited for that. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I'm surprised there's actually spaces still left. Like it was like... Uh... I know I, 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 you're gone. <laughs> that sense of urgency kicked in. I'm like, oh, sh-. you know, I, I knew about it before, but I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go on an adventure. I'm going to do it. So yeah. 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 Apparently there's an amazing breathwork facilitator there too. Mm, uh, yeah. And the inside yeah. circle guys, like I love that documentary. The work is so, it moves me to tears. It's so powerful. Uh, and it's, it, it sort of what we do in men's work and stuff, you know? So yeah. 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 I can't wait. Yeah. I, I just want to mention, I have a lot of respect for breath work too. You know? mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. Breath work is doing really... Wim Hof technique is bit as well lately. Yeah. 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 It's uh, it's very interesting. You know, um, you know, shaking practices and breath work. I mean, these, you know, I told you these, these have been, you know, part of humanity's wisdom traditions, you know, forever. Mm. Right. And it's just mm. like, we're just kind of rediscovering those, you know, in the West. Yes. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. I know breath work, uh, for instance, just having waking up the other day, feeling dysregulated, just my nervous system felt a bit out. Um, and just doing a couple rounds of breath work just instantly brought me back down to a grounded place. Yeah. And it was just the the contrast is night and day, right? It's like yeah. wow. Yeah. 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 There's, there's one particular breath work is uh called biodynamic breath work which uh, mm. if you've ever heard of, but that's, that's an interesting one. If you're ever kind of like curious to kind of explore um, breath works that are kind of specifically meant to deal with trauma. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Great. Okay. Uh, Biodynamic breath work. And ju- just really quickly off the cuff and then maybe we could wrap it up, but um, are there any other sort of practices that you point people to that are helpful for energetic regulation that you've found to be effective? So we, we've talked about, um or somatic inquiry tre uh, uh, exercise yeah yeah, um, yeah. i like gone. stanley rosenberg the this book do you know that accessing the healing power of the vagus nerve no no i haven't actually oh, this is a super book it just came out a few years ago and mm. uh stanley rosenberg he's from the netherlands mm. and he created something quite brilliant it's a it's a really quick way to reset the vagus nerve and it takes like, like mm. a minute or two uh, I find it really helpful for people with, let's say, high anxiety. So if, if mm. I'm working with somebody who has like high level anxiety, I would start with Stanley Rosenberg, which is super simple. I'll send you a video to show, you know, you can learn it just from watching a three, four minute video. Great, uh, great. Really beautiful to quickly downregulate the nervous system. Um, mm. It's it's something you'd have to like keep doing, which is different than TRE and that TRE is cumulative, which mm. makes it interesting um uh in that regard but anyway that's that's a super resource to know about great okay maybe i'll have to i'll have to read it so cumulative meaning sorry just really quick yeah so what what tre does to you know basically to the body is cumulative so every single session that you do is changing the body Ah, Um, okay how where your body is going to be after let's say 10 sessions 50 sessions 100 sessions like it is something that is cumulative. Um, you know, if you if you did you know a hundred sessions and then you never do it again, your body would never go back to the way it was. Oh wow! Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I see. Versus it's, a that other approach, which is it's sort of yes. like a one off that it might yeah. just help to regulate yeah. you, but it's not going to like maybe yeah. do a long lasting thing. So it's right. breaking up this chronic tension in a permanent way. Oh wow! I see. I see. Yeah. Oh, that's powerful. Yeah. Oh, Chris, I'm so grateful to speak with yeah. you. Thank you so yeah, much for your time. Here. Seriously. It's a lot of yeah. fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We should do it yeah. again. And also, yeah, I can't wait to meet you. Yeah. Um, all right, Chris. Yeah.
Yeah. Okay. Have a great day. Have a, have a beautiful day.